Academy sessions for spring 2022. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and, um, you know, reflect on the atrocities that have, occur have occurred in, in uh, the Ukraine with the Russian invasion. We are thinking of the Ukrainians and all of the innocent victims and all of the refugees created um, from that aggression. So we are thinking of them. I also wanted to um, remember a dear colleague that recently passed away, Marie Pickerill. Uh, she was just um, instrumental in, in getting students involved in her classes and she did what inclusive instructors do. So we do remember her. Um, today, we have uh, a professor of chemistry to talk with us. Um, Dr. Rick Farr, he is going to be speaking about what inclusive instructors do. And we got a lot of our ideas from um, a book that he'll be sharing with us. And um, we are fortunate to have uh, Rick talk to us today. So thank you for joining us. All right, so live transcription is on. So if you want that, uh, it is available. Um, so today, um, I thought I'd talk about inclusivity in the classroom and what, and what inclusive instructors do. And that's going to be kind of a range of things, depending on what courses you teach, who's in your class and things like that. But I wanted to do this for those of us who are, you know, maybe first beginning to think about this or who's student population has changed somewhat, or for whatever reason. Um, probably should have done this first semester because I think this would have been helpful as we were doing the other um, topics. But <clears throat> so I ran into this book when we were trying to figure, when I was trying to figure out what I would present on. Um, and I was thinking of colleagues of mine and um, trying to reach those who, maybe haven't thought about inclusive teaching or equity in their classrooms or have done it, but don't know how to approach um, making changes to their classroom. So I, this to me is kind of somewhat like a self-help book. Like um, it's gonna introduce things and make you think about things, but it's not gonna make you, you know, you know, the 10 best practices of successful business people. It's not gonna make you a successful uh, inclusive instructor per se, but it's going to get you thinking about things that you can do in your classroom, outside of your classroom, that will begin to um, begin to uh, in introduce equity or more equity into your classroom. All right, so a few goals for today. Um, increase one's awareness of the diversity and heterogeneity of our, our campus and, and our and our student population and our campus population. Better identify and understand the individual attributes and social identities of your students. More effectively create and maintain a welcoming atmosphere for all students. And then increase the flexibility, pliability, and malleability of courses, instruction, and materials. So I used each of those words kind of because they have a slightly different meaning and we'll talk about that when we move forward. <clears throat> so, the book has contains a bunch of quotes from different instructors on what they believe inclusive instruction means. And some of them are, are a, a bit more, some are simple one sentence statements and some of them are a bit more uh, inclusive. Um, and this is the first one in the book. And I think there's a reason they chose it to be the first one in the book because I think it, it uh, encompasses kind of what I think of is inclusive teaching and probably what a lot of people do. And that's just being aware of who's in your class. So inclusive instruction is teaching that recognizes and affirms a student's social identity as an important influence on teaching and learning uh, processes, and then works to create an environment in which students are able to learn from the course, their peers and their teacher, while being their authentic selves. So it works to disrupt traditional notions of who succeeds in the classroom and the systematic inequities inherent in a traditional educational practices. Okay, so talking to my colleague yesterday, uh, Matt Kranswick, um, and he is part of the Board of Education D60 here in Pueblo. And he was at a, at a conference uh, over the weekend 
um, and saw a talk on diverse, so DEIB. So we have been, you know, we always hear diversity, ed, equity, and inclusion. And this group included belonging, um, where it's not just being included, it's actually feeling and understanding that you belong in the group that you're with. Um, and I think that's a big piece of where the student can be their authentic selves, right? They're not just included in the class, but they can actually be who they are in the class. Um, so I like that added piece of belonging so that it's not just, hey, you're in the class, but you actually belong here. And I think that's a big part of what inclusive teaching is. All right, so. Another, hold on. Okay, put in okay, so today there's kind of four things I want to look at. I want to look at how we approach a class before it even starts, right? What are you thinking about? How are you setting up your course uh, so it's inclusive before you really even know who's in your class? Uh, and we've talked a little bit about that in previous sessions. You know, we've got flipped classrooms and all the other uh, modalities that we use um, to try to set it up so students have, all students have a chance at success. Um, I wanna talk about what we do on our first day, day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week adjustments, if there are any, and how you approach those. And then what is an institution we're doing um, to be inclusive campus, not just you know individual classrooms, individual faculty. And that one, I honestly don't know, but I'm thinking, I was thinking about that because that was mentioned in the book. Okay, so going back. And this is in the forward of the book. So before we even get into the book, the forward mentions four things that are associated with inclusive instructors or inclusive teachers. They take responsibility for making teaching their curriculum inclusive. So right, it's on their shoulders to make their courses inclusive. They continue to learn about their students and their teaching. So it's not just a fixed thing. There's adjustments made as you go on in a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week in your class. And that doesn't mean you make permanent changes to your class, but you make adjustments for the population that's currently in front of you. Um, three, they care about and for each and every student they teach. That's not always easy. And, <laughs> and they change their teaching based on evidence about the practices and support uh, that support and challenge students, uh, to all students to thrive. Okay, so that's not even in the book. That's just in the four. And I thought that was a nice four things to really think about um, as we try to become more inclusive in our courses. Um, okay, so let's talk about before we even start a course, what do we do um, and what are we thinking about as we design a course and write a uh, syllabus that's associated with the course? Um, obviously, we've seen different modalities, but I'm, I'm thinking about how we approach the course, not necessarily how you're going to um, how the course is going to be necessarily designed, you know, if you're, are you going to do flip, are you going to do, you know, things like that, but how are you setting up your syllabus so that students, when they first see it, feel that they're, they belong in that course and that they're going to succeed in that course, right? So I'm thinking, like, what do I do? So our, our syllabi are books now, right? They have so much material in them. So I think about, the first thing I think about is organization of the syllabus. So you can find materials in the first two pages that are relevant to your success in the course. So grading, right? How are things gonna be graded? When are, thing, when are graded materials due? What's the flexibility of that? And things like that. So I want to have a discussion on this. Um, what you're thinking about as you prepare your course, before you've even met your class, and how do you set up your syllabus so that students feel included and feel that they belong in the course? Okay, so I'm willing, I, I'm, so I'm very flexible on this because I've 
you know, I, this is something I really haven't thought about much. You know, I thought the syllabus is like, you know, this is this information um, and students look at it once and, and that's it, you know, and because I make them look at it once. Um, but how can we make that different, right? How can we set it up so that students go there to get their information? Thoughts? I don't want to talk the whole time. <laughs> I would jump in if I could, um, because there have been some studies that I've seen about like the tone of the syllabus and how students are either motivated or not motivated just based on the way that that's, you know, often we're kind of coached to be really harsh in our syllabus and then we can be more lenient later on. But I feel like I've heard so many stories about students that drop a class because they looked at the syllabus and they felt like I'm not going to be successful on that course or that instructor is not going to be there to support me and they don't even take the course. So just not even so much changes to what's in the syllabus, but just the tone of it, just feeling like I'm there to help and support you versus I'm here to, you know, lay down the law and make sure you don't do the wrong thing. So there's one, one perspective, I guess. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I think, so I teach chemistry, right? And a lot of students come in thinking that they're not, they'll be lucky to pass the class, right? Because of whatever history or, so I think that's a really good point, right? So how can we lighten the tone in, in a syllabus to make it less rigid or harsh? 195 word art. Windows, <laughs> Windows 95 <laughs> word art. How can I help you today? A little light bulb mm -hmm. that comes up and talks uh, with you. Bit emojis. <laughs> bit emoji images or photos of yourself. Uh, so I saw, yeah, so, Karen, so I was talking to Karen. I don't know if Karen's on. Um, Yeskovich. And she said using avatar. An mm -hmm. avatar mm -hmm. of yourself uh, on your Blackboard page and in your uh, online communications is apparently really helps, which is something I never thought of, right? So I got my nice little picture of myself and which is kind of, yeah. And, and I can see where uh, an avatar might be a lot less, you know, mean looking. <laughs> <laughs> than myself but how, yeah so how can we how, how can you change the tone of a, a syllabus when really kind of syllabus is is kind of defining what the course is right so how do you change the tone chris is talking and not and muted i can't see. oh I, I just think that's a great question because i i agree with bridget that the tone does definitely matter and um, in Spanish, sometimes Katie can speak to this, but we, we quiz the students on the content of the syllabus and then we yeah. give them some, some points. But I think the tone, um, instead of, um, I, I think there are ways that you can uh, approach yeah. the language of the syllabus to then be more student friendly. And, you know, I am sure there are several great suggestions that Bridget would have, but I tend to, you know, say if, for example, you're an athlete, you can, you know, make up the quiz. I tend to let students make, make up exams if they're absent, you know, and they have excused absences. So instead of saying you have four exams on these dates, and if you miss them, you get a zero, that to me is harsh language. I would rather have language that is more accommodating, if you will. And that was our big topic, the difference between equity and accommodation. Yeah, so I know like on my first day, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but on the first day, I usually go through the syllabus, right? And maybe, and, and this year I changed that where the students have access to the syllabus and I give them an interactive thing to do, right? So they have to find information about the course from the syllabus, working with each other to fill out these um, questions, like, you know, when are office hours and things like that. Instead of me standing up there and dictating what's in the syllabus, students are finding the material and working with each other to find the material. And, that, and I can see where that would be less harsh than me, you know, kind of standing up there and dictating the rules of the course and how things are going to run. So I can, you know, I can, that's not necessarily 
adjusting the syllabus, but it's adjusting how the syllabus is introduced into the course. What else do people do? I create a plain language syllabus because our default syllabus is <laughs> awesome. a bureaucratic 30 page oh micro gosh. document yes. filled with gen ed SLOs, which I don't think are required, but take up four pages themselves. And our people aren't even sure how to read those things because they're not even the SLOs for the courses. So if you want to put your own SLOs in there, then Gen ed SLOs. And then you have even more. Yeah. And then it just becomes like an unreadable document. Like even like in a document design perspective, yeah. like it's unreadable. So that's you, a misunderstanding yeah. about which Gen ed SLOs need to be listed though. Yeah, I nice. went through this with uh, HSHM. They were listing every Gen ed SLO and you only list need to list the ones that are actually yeah. touched in your course. So, I, so it's still a big document. Oh, oh, and it's, it's like, and, and there's like, about four sets of SLOs, right? Mm -hmm. so, you have, yeah. so I think, so what I've done with those, and I don't know what anyone else has done, is I split it, right? So I've got a document that is just course information about the course, like how things are graded, when things are due, and then I've got a supplemental document that's not, even, I don't even print. Um, that's not, that's, there are two separate documents that I put on Blackboard that contain the SLOs, and those kind of things. So what's in my document that students see initially is, you know, the course format, um, disability resources, their, re their other resources, uh, you know, math learning center, science learning center, and those kind of information. Um, and then I've also started included um, like the counseling center information and that side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but not all the SLOs, yeah, which seems to, well, it saves trees, um, but it also, it, it makes the syllabus a lot easier to read. Anything else? Any other ideas? Okay, so um, I've also, taken an approach, so science is somewhat notorious for, you know, chapter homework sets, three exams and a final exam, and the exams count for large amounts of your, of your grade. Um, and I don't, I think that's somewhat an antiquated way to look at things now uh, and, and to assess students. So, and, and when you, you know, reading that in the syllabus that, you know, you've got four exams that are worth 80% of your grade or 75% or 60% of your grade. And knowing that's, you know, there's a number of students that struggle with exams, you know, one hour, 55 minute exams, um, you know, and they get the syllabus and they read that and they're like, you know, I'm, I get D's on exams and that's the majority of the grade, you know, if I'm lucky. So, you know, I've definitely, gone to an approach of having more smaller assignments. Uh, uh, exams still are kind of the major part of the grade, but they're not, they're not 80%. They're, they're more like 40 or 50%. So there are other assessments. Um, uh, and instead of giving, you know, one assignment per chapter, I might give three. So they're smaller, less, um, percentage uh, assignments. We also also been doing some video stuff. So students prepare videos for uh, materials, especially in labs where a lot of, uh, you know, most of the lab is written lab reports. We're starting to do video lab reports. Um, so students, which we should have been doing anyway, but now we have ways to do it, right? So there's Flipgrid and, and ways that are easy to do. So students are practicing presenting material and not just written. So, you know, thinking about, you know, second language students um, and, you know, students that struggle with writing. Um, so they have another way to, to present material. And, and it's really good for students that are really good at writing and not really good at presenting either. Um, because a lot of science is done through, through mouth, right? Through, through verbal communication. All right. So, Moving on, so 
again, so this is so this is a schematic that I found at Penn State University, and it's a nice. And I don't I don't know if you can even read that. Um, probably not. You have good eyes, <laughs> um, but it gives a nice breakdown, and I can't read it. Um, that you know what to think about when you're setting expectations for your course, what to think about and, and how to communicate and collaborate with your students and students with each other. Um, and then iteratively uh, improve. So as you're going through your course, things to think about and things to change as you go through, right? And I, you know, so I looked at this at kind of like I wanted to set this up where, what are you thinking about before the class? How are you setting things up? Um, how, you know, What's, what are you going to grade things on and what improvements or what adjustments can you make as you're going through your course? And I'll post this um, somewhere on the Google Drive um, later. I, it, I just, when I was searching for course design, this popped up and, it, and it's really kind of a nice little direction. All right, oops, what happened? I can't change. Okay, so thinking about first day. How do you make students feel welcome day one, you know, after they've read the syllabus and they're like, oh, um, day one, what are you going to do? And how are you going to identify who's in your class, right? So we don't get a lot of that information on campus at all, right? So you get the course list. And unless you do a lot of work to get a little bit of information, it's really hard to learn about anything about your students. And that, so what can we do to get more information from our students so that we got a better idea of the situation the students are in so we can create a more equitable course? All right, so um, there's a couple of things I do and then we can, we'll discuss. So I have a video of myself that's about 30 minutes long. Um, I like to talk. Uh, but it, it, it includes kind of my history, where I'm from, family stuff, um, things that I've overcome in my life, um, just to give students some perspective of who's, who's instructing the course. And then I have students do the same thing. Um, I don't let them do 30 minutes, but again, it introduces them to using Flipgrid they introduce themselves, they give some information about themselves, I give them some leading questions um, on things that they should include um, or can include, and then students get to see each other um, and get to know each other by watching videos initially. Um, the second thing I do, I do is, is give a handout that asks questions, like, some important things like, you know, what was for me, like, what was the math, last math class that you took in, in, in past? Or what was the last, you know, or what was your grade? Uh, when was the last time you had a science course? Um, do you live on campus? And, and those kind of things. Um, but talking with Bridget yesterday and reading this book, this is so what I've got on the screen there is from the book, page 140. It's a questionnaire that collects student information on the first day. And this questionnaire goes significantly deeper than I've ever gone. It asks questions well beyond what I do. And then talking to Bridget yesterday, um, she was mentioning an uh, instructor at Metro State who goes even farther, right? Asks, are they in an abusive relationship at the time, in the moment, or what's their food security, right? So. Uh, are they getting meals every day? Because the campus has resources to provide help for those students, right? So started thinking about that and it almost seems very appropriate to ask those probing questions if the student, you know, you don't have to answer it, but if the student wants to answer it and campus has resources to help the student, it almost seems like it's unacceptable unacceptable to not ask those questions. What do you think? What do you do? What do you ask your students? How do you collect information on your students so that you can make an inclusive, equitable classroom?
Well, one thing to keep in mind, though, especially is that we are mandatory reporters. If we say something, we have to do something. So you have, yeah. So you have to know the resources, how to get the resources, the students to the resources. Exactly. And so I, whenever I do ask open questions where they may say something, I do put a little small saying at the very top. It says, I am a mandatory reporter. <laughs> the students probably don't even know what that means. So. So yeah, it's on the syllabus. It's on the syllabus, right? It is, but on the documents, I remind them. Yeah. So on the document, I remind them. So this, so when I do this, I do this all first day. Mm -hmm. So we just we discuss mandatory reporting, or students find what mandatory reporting is and yeah. have to answer that before they get this. But then I would remind them also. Yeah. Um, but typically, I don't ask things that necessarily are mandatory reporting in my yeah, questionnaire. Yeah. Violence one is so that's But yeah. Should we? Should we be asking? Because we the campus has resources mm -hmm. to help these students. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I'm no, I'm asking. Question. I'm asking. Should we be doing that? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I go ahead. Um, I was going to jump into just with some additional context on that as well. That Rick and I were talking yesterday, um, and I was sharing this example of a. It was a faculty member who then went over and worked in student services for a while, and is now back in a faculty role and was just seeing this huge disconnect between the resources that were available on campus and students not knowing about that. And especially after the last few years with the pandemic, knowing that students were struggling with certain things and there were resources there to support them. So, you know, in Rick, when we were talking about it, we did bring up this idea that, first of all, we would want who, if you are asking these questions, we should be prepared to respond to them. So we certainly wouldn't want people to be asking them if they didn't know mandatory reporting, if they didn't know what resources were available. So just to be a little cautious about, you know, maybe not everybody should ask all these super personal questions, but especially if you know the resources and you have that expertise, um, you know, it could be making a connection that just wouldn't be made. And, you know, a lot of the a lot of the discussion around especially mental health issues where faculty are kind of the ones on the front lines, if you will, to you know spend the time with the students and see those see those needs before other people that we're in a very unique position to provide that support, but also just giving that caution that we don't want to put we're not mental health professionals, at least most of us aren't. So we have to also see where the lines are drawn. So just to complicate it a little more. <laughs> So I also, so I sit on the fact, on the fact, on the financial aid appeals committee, and I'm definitely, so students who don't meet certain levels of completion, like 2.0 GPA or 67% satisfactory completion of coursework, um, have to appeal to continue to get financial aid. And I'm definitely seeing more and more appeals that involve students who are struggling with some sort of like abuse or mental health issues who are who obviously weren't taking advantage of what's on campus um so to me i think including this in a questionnaire is somewhat relevant to our students and to maintaining our students and our student retention um, which is a big issue here. And I think a lot of the issues associated with retention have to do with those things right now. Mental health issues, um, abusive relationships. And I would say 50%, maybe not quite 50, but definitely over 25% of them have mentioned abusive relationships of the letters I've read recently, which I would never have expected. All right. Um, so do we know if, does campus have, I know we have the resources for these things. Are there things other than websites that help students find these things? Like are there, do we have videos about these resources? Do we know? I, I mean, I don't know. I know how to contact them, right? So I've had, I've taken students over to the counseling center, but are, are you know, like the Science Learning Center has a little introductory video about hours, the Science Learning Center, you know, who the tutors are. Do we have a similar type of thing with the resources on campus? We, coincidentally, <laughs> earlier this month, I organized a session with Pat Care, Student Conduct, and the Counseling Office. 
Uh, I think Chris Creighton was the only person that signed up to attend. We created a video of that session and posted it on the CTL site. So um, I'll make sure that's prominently sent out to everyone in the session today. Um, the directors from those departments are um, eager to support faculty um, okay. with requests for student contacts. Yeah, so I know, you know, so like for my classes that the Science Learning Center has somebody come over and talk about the Science Learning Center in my classes and I don't know if Math Learning Center. Yep. And, and they said that they also do a department tour at the beginning of the fall term. I'm not sure if they do it at the beginning of spring, but if your department would like them to come in and speak to you, they are always willing to do that as well. So you just need to reach out to PAC CARES. That's PAC, a CARES. Good, PAC CARES is a great first point of contact. Um, they refer out to the different Do they go out? So there's like Yeah, so that's like your one-stop shop there. Okay, mm -hmm. so they've set it up that way now. Good. Highly yeah. responsive. Yeah, okay. I get responses because I put in them several, but very regularly working with students, uh, referrals to pack cares or resources, and always within an hour. Yep. Wow, within yeah. an hour. Okay. That's good to know because that's we would need that if we were to include this. So what level do so how many people do questionnaires for their students to learn? Chris does. <laughs> um, to get information about your students and at what level do you do it? Chris, what level uh, do you do it? It's mostly just for me to get more demographic information on them. Um, my initial goal was to get a sort them into uh, groups um, in a more equitable way. Um, so I don't probe super deeply, <laughs> but I do do weekly self assessments of students You're every ready. Friday. They do it back to me on Mondays. And then those, I do pick up on things that I do follow up with students on. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that shortly. Mm -hmm. Don't go there yet. Okay. <laughs> anybody else? So does anybody else do it like an initial questionnaire on their students to try to get some additional information? And how deep do you go? I get, um, I do a questionnaire, but it is, this is Amaya speaking in biology. And uh, I do a questionnaire, but it's more about their science background. Like, you know, when was their last biology class? Uh, you know, for my 182, you know, how long since you took high school biology and for my upper divisions courses, some people have taken molecular before they take my course, some people have taken biochemistry, so I try to get a field uh, for that. I don't ask, I ask their emphasis, you know, like what are you, are you pre-vet, are you um, wildlife, you know, but I don't ask about personal, it's more like, um, but I had a couple comments about what you were speaking before, if I could say, before. Um, and this is just kind of an observation and there's no answer, but I was just seeing, you know, we're talking about counseling and doing this coaching years. And now, you know, I, I see my relationship with my students as a professional relationship. And now, you know, we're talking about asking these very personal questions that I'm really not qualified to <laughs> deal with, uh, despite my good intentions. And I, I'm reminded of how uh, police are also taking a role now of having to be counselors to homeless and, 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 and people on the street and how um, it seems like as a society, we're maybe not providing those services and shifting them to other places. You know, like I, I do think of a university as a place of higher ed. Uh, and I'm not saying, I mean, I think I, I refer students to care packs all the time. I love that. It's really easy and I always get their permission. Hey, I think you're struggling, do you mind? So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I'm just making the observation how, you know, we're <laughs> we're having to deal with some things that I wouldn't expect, or maybe 20 years ago were not the preview of, of campuses. So that was my observation. No, I totally agree with you, Amaya, concerning um, how much more is somewhat expected of faculty and, and a, a lot of other frontline, you know, individuals. Um, I'm just wondering, like, so I definitely get a number of students that I, you know, who have come into the office uh, to discuss some mental health or, or something like that. Um, and, and I refer to students, you know, to the counseling center, but now to PAC CARES. Um, but is it more inclusive to get that information another way instead of having them have to 
walk into your office, you know, over jump over that barrier um, to get that information, or is it is it better just to get it from a simple questionnaire and then address it that way? I don't I don't know, but I agree that that does open up a lot more work um, potentially for the faculty. But if it's if it's a simple uh, simple if it's simply to get them re to resources that they that they have identified that they believe they need i don't know maybe it's maybe that's a better way to approach it than getting it to a point where they have to come into your class into your office to get help you know or to ask for help i don't know and and i would love to hear from bridget on this because bridget <laughs> after reading the survey reading the book I kind of feel as if the questionnaire is almost too personal. And I was wondering your thoughts on the questionnaire on 140 to 142. Um, the other thing is um, I wrote in the chat, I'll try to put it up, but I just was going to ask Rick, um, the end of the survey on the screen asked you for their expectations for so has anyone in the group asked this question to their students? And like, what types of feedback do students give you about how your class can be more inclusive? And so I, I'm not sure, you know, if our students would even know how to respond to the last question on the survey. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Bridget, if you if you could. Definitely. Um, and again, like the example I was sharing with Rick is, I don't want to say it's an extreme view, but it, you know, it certainly is something that I think, you know, we were both like, wow, that's, you know, that, that goes beyond. And I will fully admit the courses that I teach, I use more of an open-ended question approach, kind of like a, is there anything you want me to know about you that will impact your success in this course? And I just leave it pretty open-ended and that's where they will often share those kinds of things with me, um, or even just asking what, what does success look like for you in this course? And that's a good way to know that they wanna get an A and they wanna really dig in, or they're just taking this as a requirement and they wanna you know, kind of just skate by, like that's certainly helpful to know like where they even are coming into it. So I don't personally go to that um, depth of asking those questions. But again, I just feel like the last few years have changed the context and especially just, you know, certain institutions have a lot more students who have these needs who are just not getting those resources. So I'm, I'm not saying people should not do it, but I guess the worst case scenario would be to ask the question and then not respond to it or not follow up or not, or put yourself, you know, again, we're not necessarily mental health professionals. So we, we also have to be careful about where we put ourselves, but at least having some sort of open-ended option to be able to say, do any of these, you know, maybe you could even list these things and say, is there anything you want me to know related to any of these issues that could be supportive? I know some faculty will just use their syllabus or other times in class to just proactively share. Here's a few resources I want people to know exist. Um, and then feel free to follow up with me if you want to afterwards about this. Um, the other, just like Rick and I were talking yesterday, that the other issue too is that especially if you're asking this at the beginning of a course, the students may not know you. So they may not feel comfortable sharing this with someone That's they don't know. So perhaps this is even something that happens a few weeks into the course or midway, um, because as Rick was saying, like their circumstances can change during a semester. So maybe it's not even the best time to do that. I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't do it, but certainly there's lots of factors that could complicate it. Thank you. So I began doing this more because my ability to remember names is atrocious, right? So I started it so, you know, that students would put some, some kind of, not necessarily personal, personal information, but some sort of information so that I could put a name with some characteristics, right? Some personality traits. So um, it, it, I've extended a little bit to, you know, determine if people, you know, how much people work a week, um, you know, if they have jobs, where they live, um, if they have dependents. So just getting a, bit, a little bit bigger window and in information about the students so that it can be, I can be more equitable and more inclusive to, and, and understand who's more in front, and I'm going to say in front of me, but in the class, right? <clears throat> and honestly, I find some of these questions to do that even better than I'm doing right now, right? So we're trying to in provide inclusive 
courses. And to do that, you need to know some things about your students that are, may not be comfortable always to ask, right? Or the student may not share with you and that's fine, but do we give them the option to share it so that we have that information? I, I mean, to me, I would say yes. Like I'll probably be a little bit more direct with the questions. I might not go to the level that's in here, like yes, no, um, but I think to be to create an inclusive classroom, you need to know who's in your class uh, uh, more than just a name, more than just the color of their skin. Um, you need to know more about them. And then if you're gonna and if you're gonna take that to equitable classroom, where you're providing certain you know finding resources for students, you need to know more. Um, and and how how do we do that? This is definitely one way that I would consider doing it. Obviously individual conversations, but that's not always easy, you know, if you're online or if you're got a classroom of 80 kid, uh, of 80 students, you know, that personal connection isn't always easy to get. Okay, so I want to move on from this. Um, but I thought it was interesting just because this, the, the questionnaire was a lot deeper than I thought that, that I do. And I started thinking about, you know, it might be better to be more, more, ask deeper questions. Okay, so <clears throat> now, we're, now we're beyond day one. So how, you've got your course set up, you've got how it's gonna be graded and how the, how you're presenting material. Um, now, how do you, be, how do you make it more inclusive? Right. Um, to me, now I know a little bit more about my students from the questionnaire. On a on a week to week, day to day basis, are there things you change in your class or that are adjustable in your class to make that course, that semester or that eight weeks, more inclusive to the students that are in currently in that course? Right. And I would say I do a little bit, and, and I'll give you an example. So I ask students where they're from in the questionnaire. Right, so um, where they're from, where, where they were born, where they call home, things like that. Um, and I, I, then I take those and, and make, you know, maybe questions we work out in the course about each, each hometown, right? So I might add, you know, so if I've got students from um, Anchorage, Alaska, I'd put something in there about Anchorage, Alaska, or, Things like that, and nobody, you know, nobody else knows except that student realizes, hey, you know, that's be, that's where I'm from. Um, so that's something I do that would change each semester, right? And it's easy enough to do. <clears throat> Are there things you do? I mean, what can we do to make each of the students feel that they belong, or that not not even feel, make them belong in the course? Don't anybody jump, or do you just, or do you just have your course set up and you're just going to go through the material without doing that? Okay, okay. I learn, <laughs> all, I learn all their names. Yeah. I do try to get their emphasis, and I use their names a lot in class. You know, thank you, Sadie. Thank you, whatever. Uh, let's listen to what Edwin said. Um, um, and I. Uh, incorporate examples, especially I'm teaching right now 182, which is the intro class. So I have all biologists there. So uh, I put an example. Hey, we're doing receptors. So some of you cannabis people. Let's look at um, you know a cannabinoid receptor. Uh, for those of you going to medical, hey, while I use examples, brown fat in bears, um, the electron transport chain is very ineffective, and that's good if you're a wildlife. You know, I. I try to do that. Um, again, I try to keep it professional, not say, hey, for those of you who, <laughs> you know, uh, have an abusive relationship, this is for you. Because um, uh, that would be very distracting, right? Uh, but I do, I do feel my students belong in class. Um, I don't know how much that helps their grade. I try, you know, uh, just because I see that some of the students, and they come to my office, and I, you know, because um, I do some exam corrections, they have to come and, chat with me and I have some students right now who 
who have not gotten uh, higher than 50-something. Uh, and I think they definitely feel like they belong. Um, but anyway, but I'm just like, okay, <laughs> how can we do that? But, um, but those are the things I do. I, I do a lot of handouts and walk around and chat with them individually. Um, so that's what I do, being very personal. Yeah, I think names is a big thing. Um, I know I like to make, you know, especially when we're in, in, in a, a large course where there's a number of students. Um, if we're doing group work, I like to go around and definitely make sure I talk to each student, even if it's just briefly each time. Um, and if we're not, I'm definitely working to make eye contact with every student multiple times during the, during the course or during that 55 minutes. Um, and that's hard sometimes, getting students to make eye contact with you. Um, the, the, so Amaya said that it doesn't necessarily, you know, improve their grades, but is that really, I mean, you would hope that doing that would make the student want to succeed in your course and feel more comfortable you know, asking questions when they need to, but I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily the outcome I'm looking for. Yeah, I do think it's helping them. Like one of the students uh, answered a question in class last time and I'm like, did you already hear them? So I do think that I'm bringing them along in ways that maybe I wouldn't. I mean, they're not dropping off. Uh, I just don't know what's gonna, you know, so I, I uh, but it's not the outcome that, you know, it's not all the way there yet. But I do think uh, it does help. Um, another thing that I, I do ask them how they're doing, but I'm probably too casual every morning. How's everybody doing? And my the one answers, I'm doing great. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, everybody else. I'm not <laughs> doing it uh, on a written form might be better. And the other thing uh, that I do, and I'm just strange because I think you want somebody to say something, um, is I share some of my stuff. You know, once in a while, you know, I'll share, you know, my car broke down and, you know, and I had to buy a new one in taxes. I didn't realize you had to pay all these taxes. That was really that. I think everybody related to me, uh, you know, when I was so shocked about um, how much it cost to buy a car in Colorado. So anyway, so I do share little things like that that I think might make them feel like they belong. Or I tell them, I remember being really confused about this when I was your age. Yeah. So another thing I do is try to notice who's not there, right? And then talk to them the next time. So, you know, making them aware that I'm aware that they're not there. Um, because I definitely, there are definitely some courses I have trouble that attendance is not where it needs to be. And that clearly translates to success in the class, right? There's no doubt. Um, so I, I make it a point to notice who's not there and then either contact them through email or, you know, talk to them the next day for the next class meeting to make them aware that I'm aware that, hey, you weren't here. Um, and, and why, you know, what's going on? Is there something happening? You didn't contact me. You know, if you're going to miss a class, you know, Make sure you contact me so I know what's going on um, and so we can get you the material, things like that. So I think, you know, just making no, those simple, no, noticing those simple things, which isn't always easy when there's, you know, 80 people in the class, but, um, and, and students move around and things like that, but um, making a real attempt to, to notice who's present and who's not and getting a hold of those people that it, were not there. Um, that seems to help. But I definitely have some courses where attendance is not not good, and and they're upper division courses right now. My lower division courses are fine. It's my upper division courses that I've got a lot of students who are struggling, who are you know who are on campus their freshman and sophomore years were COVID years, and right now they're battling to to get through. Other thoughts. So I know. So Chris was saying um, about how he does questionnaires each at the end of each week. Yeah, I do a weekly self-assessment wherein I assess not only how they are conceptualizing the math in the class, but also how they're doing, how they're working together in their groups, anything I want to know. I've actually put in some packed cares requests due to those uh -huh. because they've exploded things. And I talk to the students about that. I don't do it without telling them. Yeah. 
Um, I also do daily exit tickets just to figure out how it's going day to day. Not everyone does those because if it's going smoothly, there's not really too much to disclose. So this is all. But I have a chunk of students that they are having issues with questions. They do disclose things on those too. So. What an important thing. And I also think like all of this should be like disjoint from like grades yeah. and stuff because like that's a separate thing altogether. Like if you think about like Fink's taxonomy of learning, like this is the other half of it. Like, I want you to be a good and better person and how can I help you with that part of, of learning? And that is higher ed. Yeah, that's higher ed. That's how like that's almost impossible to assess for a lot of different things. So Building in that stuff is tricky, uh, but it should be done intentionally. How do you do your questionnaires, Chris? Do you do them through Blackboard every week, or do you do them with paper? How do you conduct those? Uh, I have it on paper. Um, I used to have them do it at the end of class every Friday, but then I started asking really mean questions on their assessments, and so they were taking too long. So I just had them take it home over the weekend and turn it back to you know, on uh, Monday. <laughs> And they do, they bring it back. Yeah. Oh. What'd you say, Emma? Oh, I was just wondering about the success rate of students bringing back the questionnaire. Yeah, how many students do you? Almost everyone. Almost everyone. Um, I may need to remind some of them and send it to them via email, but almost everyone does it. I, mar I do mark it as a grade, but literally, did you do it? Is it. <laughs> I do assess learning outcomes on them as well because I have some meta learning out objectives for how to think about math and they have to do like short responses about that. So there are assessments on them too. It's also encouraged them to do it. So how how much time would a student spend on it? I think they do it five, ten minutes. Just a short yeah, kind of just pages, five, ten minutes. Quick response. Yeah, a couple sentences each. Okay. Yeah, I like that. And I I tend to do quizzes, but it doesn't have the personal side of it. Um, you know, like, how are you doing? I know, like, when Brian Van who was here, they, they did clickers, and every day, like, the first question is, like, how are you doing, one through five? Um, and he could definitely see trends mm -hmm. with students. Um, and, you I know. I've seen trends with all of you when you guys give exams. Because <laughs> then I get, because I don't give exams. They're like, I've put your class on hold this week because Rick's being mean with <laughs> chemistry. This week, <laughs> and I have to study more for that. <laughs> so I see things like that too. Okay. <laughs> Chemistry always makes my courses look good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's our that's our purpose. Um, so does anybody else do some sort of like self like I I like that idea because you know, like we were talking earlier, that first questionnaire, that first day, students don't know you. Um, they don't necessarily comfortable with you, and, and definitely, student situations change drastically. Some of them through the semester, uh, especially you know if you are you know if you're insecure with their housing or your food, um, or, or weren't initially and, and now are because you lost your job or now you have a parent you're taking care of or whatever you know in 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 a four and a half month time frame, a lot of my students' situations change significantly that I'm not aware of or wasn't previously aware of or didn't think about, right? You know, you're in my class, you should be here. Um, but I think adding some way to to address that and, and asking those kind of questions um, on a weekly basis would be really nice. It is, you know, is inclusive, um, showing that maybe you care and, you know, campus has resources to help. So. Um, and, and that's a bigger part of what the campus is providing now uh, because we need to. Um, other thoughts? What do you do on a week to week basis or a day to day basis in your class that isn't necessary in your syllabus, right? How flexible is your course? Um, that's what I mean by flexibility like quick things that you can do on a day to day basis as compared to, you know, pliability, something that you make is longer term but not necessarily permanent. I was just thinking about your the way you brought in the issue of belonging to and you know just the very simple like think pair share or just having students like work problems together because if they're in a class and they 
they know other people and they've had time to talk to different people and maybe mixing them up a little bit, having them just before we ask, are there any questions? Like having them talk through something with someone else, even for two minutes, gives them you know a little bit more of a sense of community and then they can participate a little bit better. So I, I was kind of honing in on your in a different way on your thought around belonging and just providing those opportunities for students to really get to know each other so that they feel like they're part of a class together. Those are pretty easy to build in. Yeah, so along those lines, you know, thinking about how you group students, like, you know, I'm thinking labs, right? Where labs, I get to determine who works with who. Um, and I definitely, so students, when I first started here, student, you know, basically who you sat next to was your partner, or I let you switch. Uh, but now I assign each week a different partner to you. Um, so that you actually work with other people every week. Um, and that normalizes more or less, you know, students, you know, there's one really good student or two really good students who are going to carry, you know, their partner um, through the semester. And if they have the same partner every semester, or they have the same partner through the semester, then the grade of the one student tends to be higher maybe than it should be. Um, uh, so I like to have students switch also to work and get to know other students. And obviously, you know, I can, there's a couple of students in one of my labs right now who you probably wouldn't necessarily choose to be paired with, but, um, you know, it's, it's one session, it's one two hour session and students do really well. I, I you know, I think it's, and at, at the end of the semester, they all, or a number of them in their evaluations note that it was really good that they had to switch. Mm -hmm. um, they got to know a lot more people and, they, and you know, they're like, initially I didn't like that because I was going to work with my friend who's on my, you know, on the softball team with me. Mm -hmm. um, but they all, I've never had a negative comment about that. You know, I've had maybe a weekly negative comment like, wow, that was a tough two hours. Um, but overall it's, people get connected that wouldn't be connected otherwise. And I'm wondering in a classroom, how do you do that? And I think Chris said, you know, he's got from his questionnaires, he's able to more equitably make groups. Yep. So do they stay the same through the semester? No, it has fully totally devolves into organized chaos. I don't know who works well with who and who should be moved away from who that field. And kind of where we're at right now, because at some point I forget to switch the groups. That's just a me thing. Though. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, I haven't switched the groups in forever. Oh, well. <laughs> um, but I do ask them, like, every week how the, they're working with the people around them, and they do tell me how other people are doing in the class. Yeah. Like, if they notice there's a significant change with someone that's working around them, um, some students will tell me that. Like, oh, I noticed the students, like, really, like, picking up content more this week than mm -hmm. prior weeks, too. So. That's cool. Yeah, so nice. So, does anybody else do group work like that? Like, I, I definitely do in, in courses. And sometimes, I, you know, sometimes I'll do it where I assign the groups and then change them each week, or sometimes they self select. It just kind of depends on how much time I've had to prepare for that day uh, and how much I remember. Um, but, how do other people do group work to, to you know, thinking of inclusivity now um, and belonging? You know, I do the Think Fair share that Bridget was talking about, uh, but I, I realized this semester that it, I need to do a better job because last semester it was a perfect, and it's really I need to do a better job because it's really up to the students. And that last semester I had a class where it was beautiful. I mean, they all right away paired up with somebody who totally different. To I had somebody who was getting 102 in every exam with somebody who was getting. Uh, you know, 60s, and they were the partners, and they worked out really great in all the handouts and discussions. I had athletes with um, tattoo coverage people. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to <laughs> describe. The, but anyway, it was just, I thought, wow. And it felt it was a great course. But it's because they did it. Because this semester, I'm trying to do the same with 182, and I've had very reticent students. That when it's, I do a handout, and they're supposed to work in pairs, they just do it themselves. And I... I somehow need to find a way to, when it's not happening uh, naturally, like it did last semester where everybody, I mean, it was just amazing how everybody just found somebody to connect with that happened to be sitting right next to them all semester long. Um, I guess I need to think of strategies of how to um, 
promote it when it's not happening organically or where it's just so but I do but that that worked really well um, before and not this semester <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I had a student last semester in lab who would come into lab and work by herself she wouldn't find her partner and would just because she was a good student um, and didn't want to deal with other students and I'm like mm, that's not that's not how this is going to work um, you have to work with another student or you I'm not going to grade your material it's part of, you know part of it's part of what this is um, students are like faculty right <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying Chris no <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, and, and I've definitely had the same issues in my head where you expect students to, to be able to pair off or work in threes, find two other people to work with, and they choose just to sit and do it themselves. Or they'll sit with two other people, but there's no discussion at all. Um, so then, then it's, then you got to be a little bit more intrusive. I don't know what word you, but. Mm -hmm. But how do you, you know, if it's not for a grade, how do you get students to actually do it? You know, one thing that I do, I, so I use a lot of eye clicker questions because otherwise I'm just like, you know, concept, 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 you know, so we do have these think pair shares and eye clicker and the, there's a little wheel, I do it through Nearpod so they can see as the answers come in, you know, the percentage of greens versus reds. And I, I make them talk, I'm like, until, that wheel, uh, it's 70% green or more. <laughs> you guys can be <laughs> talking and, and I tell them I meditate. I can outlast you here. You know, I have, you know, so, <laughs> so they have to, uh, they have to talk and do that. Uh, so I don't know, it's not, I don't keep track of everybody, but I do feel like it at least makes them talk and, you know. Yeah, and that, that's definitely, in, mention, go ahead. I was going to say it's a group effort, right? Suddenly we're, they're all on the same boat. You know, we're not going to move forward from this question until, you know, as you know, we all get it. So I don't yeah, know. That's, that's definitely mentioned in the book where you have to wait it out, right? To wait the students out, you know, not just kind of chime in because you want to keep moving forward, but being willing to just wait that time till some, till the conversation begins again. Mm -hmm. And that's hard sometimes. sometimes. Did, did you? They started laughing awkwardly. And then I kept <laughs> waiting, and then they kept la laughing, and then some people mouthed the answer. I'm like, just say it louder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I, so I, I guess I'm still on the thing. So, on a day to day bet. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis, how flexible is your class? Like, so for chemistry, I, I don't think it's too flexible, like, because there's definitely a certain material that I, 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 you know, for let's say Gen Chem 1, that I need to get through, so students are gonna be successful in Gen Chem 2. Um, and, you know, what I do today, I need for tomorrow and that, and, and for two weeks from now, it just kind of builds, you know, like I was talking to Chris, um, about language where it's the same type of thing, right? You learn verb tenses. And if you don't know that for the next, you just, you're, you're, you're struggling. Um, but I know there, you know, I'm, I'm guessing there's other courses where you can be a bit more flexible and, and your discussions can be more associated with the people in, in the class um, that, you know, maybe next semester, it's totally different. Um, and it seems like you could be, you can make that a lot, you know, a lot more inclusive atmosphere because of that. Um, you know, and I don't know if anybody's here that is able to do that. That seems like there's a lot of STEM people in the audience at this moment, except for Chris. And I don't know if I see everybody here, but this is a lot of biology, chemistry, math people. Um, but even language, I think, is, is similar. Right, so we don't have a lot of psychology, sociology in here right now. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on that? What you can do on a week-to-week -week basis or a day-to-day -day basis to, be, to make the course more inclusive? So I'm gonna jump in and, and, and ask about assessment. 
like are you I do you have day-to-day -day assessments sorry if I go ahead Chris. I think Bridget has something to add so oh. sorry about that I don't want to jump in too much, but um, I guess I was just going to respond to the question you just asked around because um, I do teach in courses where the content isn't quite so linear or um, progressive, if you will. It's more like, I don't know what they call it, like cluster based where I could teach as much as I want in different areas. And so um, I do actually I do a thing at the beginning where I have the students kind of rewrite the syllabus in their own words in just a couple paragraphs like what do they want to get out of it what are they excited to do what are they nervous about coming up and you know just and getting a little pre-assessment about what they know and then based on that I will spend more or less time on different activities so I might and I'll tell them you know like a lot of you are really interested in this and don't have a strong background in this from what you told me. So we're going to spend extra time on this piece and we're going to cut this other part short. So I don't change my content or the structure, but I'll change how much emphasis. So it's a way of not, it's not extra work for me. It's just changing. And I'm, you know, with the content I teach, I'm able to do that more so than I could if it was chemistry. But I'll let you move to assessment. Yeah. Or, or maybe, maybe I need to rethink how we do chemistry, you know? Um, some adjustments to be more, <laughs> Chris is like nodding his head over there, um, and not be so mean to his students. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about assessments for a minute, um, for a couple minutes. So I've started doing more day-to-day -day problems, right? So instead of having one kind of large problem set, I assign more, you know, two problems a day. So students are getting, instead of one big chunk that they got to turn in in a week, they get two or three problems that they have to turn in next session. And then I've been doing um, smaller quizzes also, just to spread out the grading and the assessments. Um, but also so that students don't see this threatening 10 question, 12 question sheet that they know they're gonna to have to sit down for a chunk of time and, and work through. And, and so instead of, you know, instead of doing two problems, you know, cause students don't think that way, right? So well, some of them do, but a lot of them see this 12 question, like I gotta sit down for six hours and do these 12 questions. Instead of thinking, you know, I can do one right now in the half hour I got. Um, so I'm more breaking it out for them doing the same same thing but I'm breaking it out for them and it's not it seems to not be as threatening of a of a thing um and I'm still working on, on on evaluating this is this am I getting more homework tended in on time are students completing it more than they would on a greater percentage than they would with the large homework sets I don't I don't know the answers to that yet so thought I mean how how do you guys do it Assessing. Assessing. Well, the class that I have to do are heavy textbooks, especially. But my pre comp, I have assessment twice a week. And then I'll just take one off the second one, too. And it just goes to the flow. We have random reassess days. And so I use standard based grading. So that's like very flexible. Like mm -hmm. I can completely go back. The biggest thing that I see with or changing assessments are like, well, you don't expect students to recall. And I'm like, not really, because if everything is connected into a story, they should be recalling everything anyway. And if they need to go back up to reassess things they don't know, there's actually one incentive to do so. And two, um, they'll have to go back and relearn it anyway and go study, find more problems, and stuff like that. So, so it also cuts down grading tremendously. I grade like so fast. When you, when you reassess, do you use the initial assessment? Or do you, do you come up with a, a new assessment? Yeah, I have um, target learn, the learning objectives. I write comps aimed at those targets. So mm -hmm. I used to have variations of the problem, but I did provide a sample document of some sample problems for each one so I could differentiate the questions I asked on the topic a bit more deeper. That's one thing I'm going to want to build up more. I want to yeah. dig it in deeper um, because traditionally you just want to change the numbers. And I'm like, no, I want to make sure they understand the topic. <laughs> Yeah, so they can't just figure out how to route that one. Right. Yeah, yeah, and reading. Anybody else? 
I want to know how language does it. Happy to speak to that. So um, we, I think you know, we do the, the formative assessment, but also the summative assessment. And I think we also um, assess with oral exams. Um, and so we're constantly trying to, you know, see if students are understanding the material covered. And so you can do that, you know, just by a quick check at the start of class. I mean, recently I noticed that on an exam, students missed a grammar point. And so I just reviewed that grammar point once again in the new chapter with the new material, just kind of covering it. Um, and, you know, always recycling what they've learned, like putting it into the lessons, uh, former like arguments or former, former topics that we've discussed, grammar points, I always recycle them and bring them into the new chapter. So, I mean, I think it's a constant thing that, that we do to assess student learning. But I like your idea of maybe doing smaller uh, bits of quizzing or testing instead of, you know, big chapter exams. And Denise and I kind of talked about that yesterday. Um, you know, the idea that um, really uh, it's, it's better for students to have, you know, those smaller, um, I guess, verifiche, they're called in Italian, but they verify that they're learning. Thank you. Why is Denise laughing? Because we have very passionate <laughs> views on that. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a lot of STEM here. So I'm wondering, is there anybody that does assessments that are not written? What do you mean assessments, like a presentation? Or, yeah, something that's, that you're using to determine students' knowledge in the, in the material that you taught, or that's part of the, how they're, the part of their grade. So like a presentation would be, yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. I have, I, I'm struggling to move away from um, exams being uh, in, in my, um, in my, in the electives, like I teach virology, which is an elective, that one I'm more comfortable putting the exams to be 50% uh, because that's extra, you know, they know their core biology concepts and now they're getting a little bit extra and, you know, there they do presentations and group work a lot, you know, again, they're, uh, they have to do, um, Every, every once a week it's a whole day dedicated to discussions and group work so that is all uh and they fill out a, a weekly sheet of how what they learned before on their own about the topic and what they learned after the group discussion you know they read the literature and they turn one in at the middle of class and one at the end but on my other classes but you know but that's like the you've arrived <laughs> you know you're <laughs> you've made it but on the other ones um um, yeah, I, I just have to make sure they get all these concepts. I do have something that kind of ties in with inclusivity uh, that I do with my 182 and that they love and it's very nice. And, uh, and that is scientist spotlights. And that is uh, uh, for completion. They, you know, they, they complete it, they get their points. Um, and there are five of them during the course and they choose each time between two scientists. So they're, I prepare 10 spotlights and every time they choose a pair and it sort of goes with the topic. Uh, but I have people of color, LGBTQ community, rural uh, women, um, people from other countries, scientists from other countries. And as part of the reflection, they have to say, how did this spotlight make you feel about the kind of people who do science? Uh, and so they have to answer. And this was not my idea. It was a, a pedagogical paper that I read and I thought it looked good. And, and, uh, and they like it. I mean, they really, really do. And, um, so anyway, um, that's something that I do and I give them point, you know, it's inclusive in so many ways because <laughs> it's a science identity, but they also get points. It doesn't matter. And, and, you know, whether you understand the cell cycle or not, you, you can read people's biographies and, and stuff. Um, but I've been really inspired by, um, some of you guys' previous faculty academies, we don't do formative in biology. It's just like, learn mitosis, learn how DNA replicates, learn this. And I feel like, uh, and I talked to Denise about it, that we need like for my intro class, we need a workbook. You know, like in chemistry, you guys do exercises all the time and in math, but in biology, there is no, we don't do exercises. We just learn these concepts. So it feels like uh, we're lacking informative uh, assessments or formative opportunities. So that's been my um, inspiration for next year to do a little workbook where they have to 
you know, maybe just think about the material before the exam in, in ways, you know, that they can write it and, and think about it. Nice. So you haven't trying to figure out ways to include, you know, so we have those kind of problems that students work through. And I like the scientist thing. I've been thinking about that side of things. Um, but I've also been thinking about, you know, where kind of day-to-day -day materials come from, like gasoline, right? There's a whole chemical process to take the oil, you know, crude oil to what you're getting it putting in your car and what happens to the rest of it, right? So, you know, um, and it's all chemical, right? It's all, it's di it, to separate them, it's, it's distillation, right? Refineries are distilleries. So I've been trying to find those bits and pieces where students can, can go research a topic that's has the fundamental pieces of things I'm trying to teach, but aren't just, you know, problem based things. Um, so yeah. Uh, any other comments before we move on to our little last topic? Awesome. So in the book, it mentions that it's great that we're, you know, that classrooms are being inclusive, but if the campus isn't doing the same thing, um, then we're missing a huge piece of it, right? And um, so I started thinking about this and realizing how, I mean, how little I know about, you know, what student affairs or student activities is doing. I know little bits and things because I see announcements like uh, from different clubs or uh, my students are involved in a lot of the clubs. So I know, you know, I'll talk to them about things or they're like, hey, are you coming tonight or whatever. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, as I'm walking around campus a bit, um, you know, walking through packed cares and seeing all the pictures of the, of the people on the walls, or walking into the um, administration building and seeing the pictures in there, and wondering how inclusive we're really being, um, and are there other places we need to be addressing things, like, you know, in student spaces, like cafeteria or the student center or you know how are how is campus working to be inclusive to all the students um and I'm, I'm i'm wondering if you know moving forward maybe next you know as we get new fellows next year if there should be some sort of committee between the faculty fellows and some in individuals on the other part of campus on the other half of campus the non-academic part of campus where we're working together to increase inclusivity, not only in the classroom, and I'm sure they're doing things, I just am unaware of them. Um, <laughs> could, could we be working together better on those type of things? And, and you know, I sit on a lot of committees with these individuals and we deal with what the committee has to deal with, um, but we don't cross paths besides that. So I'm wondering if, if maybe we should work a little bit harder on, on, that, on that side of things. So, thoughts on that or or maybe more maybe you guys are more aware of what the hell is going on than i am um because i'm locked in the chemistry building most of the time um i might venture into the biology building uh because the science learning center is over there but um what are people aware of uh, based on inclusivity not academic side of things like what how are we keeping our students on campus for the time they're on campus right instead of because we have a lot of commuter students. So how are we keep, keeping them here instead of just going home, staying at home, coming back for their hour, hour and a half going home? You know, what can we do to keep them on campus? We have spaces. You mentioned, you mentioned the cafeteria and I am gluten-free. I have very specific dietary uh, restrictions and this it's, I, I never eat out. I mean, I tried this week the first time all semester and I couldn't find anything to eat. Oof. And when we were doing, uh, I was in part of research committees and I had to eat in the cafeteria and um, I had, you know, like the meal was just like a salad. No, they didn't Meat. have a salad because it was the beginning of the semester. So I couldn't even have a salad. That's the problem. Like I had a piece of fruit. So, um, uh, and that is, you know, uh, GI tract issues as I one of the rising one of the fastest rising uh, diseases or you know health problems especially among young people it's not just us one of my daughters has IBS and in her campus I mean she's if you saw her you would think she's anorexic because she can't eat anything on campus so it's not just us but anyway if you wanted to be 
keep people here. <laughs> Food that is um, inclusive would be, <laughs> uh, you know, because I can't eat on campus. So and I keep my office by myself. And I think that uh, the gluten thing is a huge issue, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, I, yeah. and, and, and I mean, I have two daughters who are, who struggle with gluten and that's a, you would think we would be able to address that. So do you think it would be beneficial to have some sort of, you know, it, it, informal committee between faculty, especially faculty fellows, because this is kind of our purpose um, and, you know, individuals from different areas in the non-academic side of things. And, stu and students, mm -hmm. yes. Like, to me, like, I feel like even to these things, yeah. it's kind of tight. Like, education students would probably really benefit from these conversations, yes. too, because they'll see it going into the school. Yeah, yeah. So is it something we should think about moving forward, especially since, you know, maybe we're not going to be fellows and let somebody else? <laughs> I think Thanks. any bridging like that is always good. I can't imagine any cons to that. I think pros, you know, another thing I was thinking about, this is very much harder to fix than, you know, having more diverse food options is uh, our students are, you know, we're a Hispanic serving institution, but the only Hispanic people are the service people on campus. They're not on the faculty, they're not, you know. Uh, we just hired uh, a, a Mexican, we just hired a Hispanic male in biology, and it's it just amazing. I'm just so excited to, for our students to have that. Um, but that's a little bit trickier, right? But we just, our faculty, we don't represent our student population at all. So I found that, so we were, you know, we did two searches this year and it wasn't that we didn't try. We got, we had no Hispanic applicants. Mm -hmm. We had actually one, but not, yeah. But that was it. We, we just don't get, which is odd. Well, it's not odd because, you know, the representation isn't that high and they get better positions and, and, and more higher paying positions, which is because everybody's trying to do the same thing. And we just don't. We just I, we don't we didn't get any applicants like that. It was a struggle, which is it was just unfortunate because, you know, I was hoping we would be able to diversify a bit more because we are not. Yeah, the one thing that I've learned a little bit about hiring things because you also have to consider the environment that the faculty members are moving in, yes. and that is a big thing. Yeah, so um, for a lot of things, um, I was listening to this one podcast where she was a Hispanic uh, uh, faculty member. She moved to a small liberal arts school, school in Massachusetts, and then she's like, "I have to drive an hour to get my nails done at a place that does it the way I like it, and to get the food that I grew up with, I have to go a half an hour." Yeah. And Things like that we have to consider. Resources. Uh, not only the campus, but the community in which the campus exists for maintaining staff and faculty. And I think the Colorado State University system needs to think about equity. I mean, they want to support CSU Pueblo, but where are salaries? You know, the Vision 2028 has no pocket of money, pull of money to give us more salaries that you know that so we can retire before we're 75 uh you know i mean uh so i think that new conversation is to happen that if you know you can't have your faculty serving uh you know underrepresented groups uh living on a shoestring while the faculty for collins uh you know i mean you know serving more privileged children they're also getting paid more so i think that uh, i wasn't here with vision 2028 was you know that, but I feel uh, like bringing us and training us, with, you know, better that way. Uh, and that might help uh, attract. I mean, I am actively looking for other positions, and the salary is a big part of that. Yep. Um, yep. Because it's a long time. I mean, 25 years, it's a long time. Yes, it is. You're going to be able to retire by 75. You're lucky. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it, it is difficult. It was difficult to me to hear that Mohammed's 
daughter got married last year. I, got, I didn't have five minutes. My daughter's good. I never could have pulled a wedding because I had so much work. And, you know, it would have been the, the money thing would have, you know, it's just, it seems like we have a class system <laughs> on campus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, you're right. System with CSU. So, yeah, attracting people uh, here is. Yeah, yeah, so a lot you know, of things. Sorry to bring that up. It's always no, no. To I think, but we—I was having this discussion with Chris. Uh, the equity amongst faculty is not there. So, so we're winding down here. It's ten twenty-eight. Um, any last thoughts, comments, concerns? No. Anything from Chris or Denise? Thank y'all for coming this morning. <laughs> nice to see everyone. Oh, wait, wait, Chris, Chris has got a comment. Nothing I can say that can fit in two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Do you, were you gonna say something, Chris? Hmm? Not you, Chris, that Chris. You're muted, Chris. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. Um, we've talked about a culture of inclusive teaching, creating an equity minded syllabus. But we also asked how our university can make a commitment to inclusivity for students and faculty. I wanted to thank Denise for directing um, the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, Dr. Farr for your presentation, Dr. Arend for your um, great advice, really um, yeah. uh, in your insight and just all you've done for our group. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we have one final Faculty Academy presentation with Amaya, uh, Professor, hey. that will be talking about best practices in college and university teaching and how to develop model teachers. So uh, that should be an interesting and, and exciting discussion to end the semester. Thanks again for joining us. And thank you, Rick. Thank you. See ya. Have a good day. Bye-bye.